I'm Bonnie Glazer, Senior Advisor for Asia and Director of the China Power Project at CSIS. Thank you all for joining us today for a timely and important conversation about the COVID-19 pandemic and collaboration between the United States and Taiwan. Taiwan's coronavirus response is among the best globally. To date, Taiwan has had 440 cases and six deaths in a population of almost 24 million people. The world has much to learn from the Taiwan model. Taiwan has a world-class healthcare system and has shown how technology can be applied to enhance contact tracing and prevent virus spread. Its government has kept the public closely informed with accurate information and won high praise and confidence from its people. Schools have remained open, along with most businesses and restaurants, which has limited the negative impact of the pandemic on Taiwan's economy. As other countries face challenges in combating COVID-19 and getting their economies restarted after lockdowns, and they look for models to emulate, Taiwan demonstrates that democracies can effectively rein in epidemics. In March, the United States and Taiwan signed a joint statement pledging to share best practices and cooperate on a range of activities, including developing tests and vaccines, medicines, and exchange medical supplies and equipment. And just last month, Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar held a virtual meeting with Taiwan's Minister of Health and Welfare, Chen Shizhong. Today, we are pleased to continue that conversation. So I'm first going to introduce our, uh, our guests, um, and after they give their remarks, we're going to have uh, a Q&A and, and a discussion. So first, joining us from Taiwan, we have uh, Taiwan's Vice Premier, Chen Ximai. Um, and he is, in addition to being Vice Premier, he's Chief of the Cabinet Department for Information Security. Prior to his political career, uh, Chun was a physician at the Chungo Memorial Hospital and on the medical faculty at the Taipei Medical University. Vice Premier Chun currently oversees interagency coordination of Taiwan's COVID-19 epidemic prevention measures, including applying big data analytics and developing social distancing apps to track and contain community spread. Joining us from Washington, D.C., is Deputy Secretary of Health and Human Services, Eric Hargan. Mr. Hargan was sworn into office as Deputy Secretary of the Department in October 2017. And in this capacity, he serves as the Chief, Op Chief Operating Officer and is responsible for overseeing the Department's daily operations and leading its policy and strategy. And then after we hear from uh, Vice Premier Chen Ximai and uh, Deputy Secretary Eric Hargan, my colleague Steve Morrison is going to provide some comments on their remarks. Uh, Steve is Senior Vice President at CSIS and Director of the Global Health Policy Center, and of course, one of the world's leading experts on global health uh, issues. So with that, I'm going to invite uh, Vice Premier Chen Ximai to give his remarks. Hello, and uh, good morning, Washington, D.C. Thank you, Bonnie, for your kind of introduction. I am pleased to join Deputy Secretary of Health and uh, Human Service Eric Hagen and the CSIS Senior Vice President Devon Morrison today. I would like to share uh, about Taiwan experience to uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19. In Taiwan, recording has started. We currently have a total 440 confirmed cases. We are pleased that 80% of these cases have been recovered and there have been zero local transmitted cases for 26 consecutive days, while we must remain vigilant 
business and the school are open as usual. And the even baseball games are in full swing. Taiwan has proven that democracy are well positioned to win the fight against COVID-19. We owe our success to cautious assessment of outbreak in China and an early response. During the 2003 SARS outbreak, lack of transparency from China and our inclusion from the WHO mean that we had to take decisive action on our own. That experience and our natural suspicions of everything China says spur us to quick, effective risk assessment and action this time. Due to the prevalence of COVID-19 in Wuhan and the frequent travel across the Taiwan Strait, we did not wait for directives from WHO. We took swift action on border control as early as December 31st. Then we established our Central Epidemic Command Center, or CECC, stockpile critical epidemic prevention supplies, and ensured that our hospital and the medical personnel are ready. Now allow me to introduce three pillars of Taiwan model. Transparency, technology, and teamwork. Transparent and open information is vital to Taiwan model, as this builds a fundamental for public trust in government. Since last January, Health Minister Chen Shizhong has been holding daily CECC, CECC press briefings. During these briefings, health officials share information about the latest case, raise public awareness, provide higher education, and explain policy decisions. Government agents also update COVID-19 information on their official websites and the social media accounts. Transparency is important for raising public awareness and the tackling disinformation which can be as damaging as the virus itself. This is why Taiwan CDC has invited trust experts to share this disease trans trans prevention information on major Taiwanese TV channels. People can also get health advice from a chapel on Taiwanese most popular messenger app. Moreover, the public can report cases or assess information via a COVID-19 hotline. This action are important, not just because the democracies must be accountable, uh, accountable to uh, their people, but also because the whole society need to work together to combat the coronavirus. The second period of Taiwan model is technology. As a physician by training with a background in public health, I am also currently serving as the Chief of Information Security of Taiwan. The current crisis presents an opportunity to combine big data with AI to protect the public health. Back in January, we uh, uh, linked our uh, government travel customs and the health care databases to shape our border control and the case identification measures and uh, uh, to uh, monitor the quarantines and the contact tracing. We have also used our national health insurance databases to create a name based racing, ration, rationing uh, system uh, for best message. This system has given at least 80% of the population in Taiwan access, access to uh, face mask, mask. 
are preventing our our uh, public panic and the supply the shortage. We have shared this measure with other nations to help them distribute medical supplies. Uh, as a democracy, this is important that the government remain accountable to the public when uh, uh, using uh, certain technologies to prevent them from being abused. We have been very carefully ensure that the scope is limited to public health. We have worked strict under the legal framework of the Infection Disease Control Act and the Personal Data Protection Act. Safeguarding fundamental freedoms and the civil liberties has always been a top priority. The third pillar of Taiwan model is teamwork. President Tsai Ing-wen has held a number of uh, nation security meetings uh, to plan and uh, design major policies. The Executive UN has been uh, coordinating efforts from various agencies. And the CECC has been uh, handling quarantine measures, preparing uh, medical supplies, and uh, following the latest development of the global outbreaks. T together with that, we have created a highly efficient platform for coordination. Uh, however, the whole society must be also work together with the government to uh, uh, defeat uh, COVID-19 at the peak of the outbreak in Taiwan. In a single day, as many as uh, 55,000 people were under quarantine in Taiwan, and 99.5% uh, of them abide by quarantine regulations. Uh, 73, 73 uh, manufacturing companies have answered the government call to increase the production of surgical masks, cre creating a national team for mask production. Even the annual Dajia uh, Mazu Pia Gui match, Taiwan, the, the largest uh, the, the Pia Gui match, was postponed after peacefully consultations and the risk communication among the relevant stakeholders. There, there was no need uh, for the government to assert its authority to postpone it. Let me conclude by emphasizing that Taiwan model can be adopted by other democracies around the world. We are pleased Taiwan and, and uh, the U.S. have established a partnership to exchange information, critical suppliers, and the best practice in policy making. I want to uh, especially thank Health Secretary Alex Azar for his comment on Taiwan and his engagement with Taiwan Health Minister Chen Shizhong. We will uh, continue to uh, work with uh, the United States on the issue of Taiwan participating in uh, WHO. Our 23 million people should not be excluded from the WHO. Taiwan should be allowed to engage in meaningful WHO participation and should be an official member. We believe Taiwan is capable of contributing to the WHO work, including the response to coronavirus pandemic. I would like to thank CSI once again and Bonnie for inviting me. I look forward to your feedback and your continuous support. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice Premier Chen. Um, and now we're going to welcome uh, Secretary Hargan. Thank you for joining us today.
We can't hear you, Secretary Hargan. I'm afraid um, your mic is muted. Can you please unmute your mic and then we can we can start over? Now? Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Thank okay, you. Great. Welcome. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate CSI organizing this timely and important event and inviting me to speak alongside Vice Premier Chen Chi Mai. Uh, you may or may not know that my first time outside the United States or North America was in Taiwan in the summer of 1988. I lived in the Taipei International Youth Activity Center, studied Chinese at Goyu Ruba, and taught English at Abushiba, uh, the California Language Academy, uh, the, the uh, uh, Jiajo Waiyu Zhongxin. Uh, it was a fantastic, really life-changing time for me, and I learned about Taiwan and even myself, uh, navigating Taipei's bus system, finding jobs teaching English to support myself, really for the first time in my life. Uh, I learned to appreciate fresh lychees, the beaches down in Kenting, uh, and the MTVs of uh, Taipei. It was a long time ago, uh, but still a great set of memories, uh, fresh and close to my heart. Uh, so, and thank you, Vice Premier, for sharing Taiwan's successful and efficient COVID-19 response and discussing some of the best practices that you all have put in place. As uh, Ms. Glazer mentioned earlier, we made it a point to personally acknowledge Taiwan's work on COVID-19. Uh, Secretary Azar had a call with Minister Chen Shicheng on April 27th, in which he thanked Minister Chen on behalf of the department and the American people for Taiwan's generous donation of 5 million face masks as well as their continuing cooperation to share best practices and resources with the United States. We greatly appreciate Taiwan's, Taiwan for sharing timely, accurate, and transparent information about its response. More broadly, HHS appreciates more than 20 years of strong health partnership between the United States and Taiwan. This partnership has been wide ranging, including the SARS outbreak response, cancer research, dengue vaccine research, and regional trainings for Zika diagnostic tools. Successful management of the COVID-19 pandemic relies on transparency, uh, information sharing, collaboration, and we're glad these practices have defined our public health relationship with Taiwan, as well as hearing about the pillars uh, that the Vice Premier shared, uh, transparency, teamwork. A lack of transparent information sharing can exacerbate public health emergencies. And information sharing is exactly the kind of international response that's needed for an international threat like COVID-19. Now is not the time to limit global lessons learned and Taiwan's contributions in combating this pandemic are to be applauded, admired, and learned from. Taiwan's successful management of COVID-19 is a result of their continuous efforts in preparedness and response against public health threats including by implementing the international health regulations. Taiwan has, we see, been incorporating lessons learned from the last time it faced a serious regional health threat during the SARS outbreak in 2003-2004. You may remember that Taiwan was initially judged by many to be one of the most at-risk populations given their proximity to and significant transport leaks with mainland China, including directly with Wuhan. To date, however, Taiwan's population of 23 million has only about 400, a little over 400 cases, as we heard, having instituted controls, testing, contact tracing in a targeted manner that has almost eliminated the possibility of community spread. As just one example, in, in 2017, we noted that Taiwan commissioned Johns Hopkins University's Center for Health Security to evaluate progress on implementing the international health regulations under the Joint External Evaluation rubric, which shows its ongoing commitment to the health and safety of its people and to being a trusted partner in international health responses. The report found that Taiwan had met most goals of the IHRs and had strengths in areas such as disease surveillance, development of national policy, and antimicrobial stewardship. Taiwan has been quite active in implementing the international health regulations, including frequent and transparent information sharing with other countries through its international health regulations focal point. As Vice Premier Chen said, Taiwan has clearly showed to the world that it is a capable and willing stakeholder in the international community. 
the United States vigorously supports Taiwan's participation as an observer in this year's World Health Assembly, or WHA, which is just a couple of weeks from now. It is deeply disappointing that the World Health Organization has excluded Taiwan from participating in the WHA and other WHO technical experts meetings. We hope they will return to the practice of inviting Taiwan as an observer at this year's WHA on May 18th. As Secretary Azar and Minister Chen both agreed during last month's meeting, no one should be isolated from this critical governing body of international health, especially in light of the COVID-19 crisis. All communities with a stake in global health should be able to contribute and to benefit from the WHO's efforts. And the WHO must take action to address the gaps highlighted by COVID-19, including the need for an inclusive approach to global health. Um, I will briefly mention a couple of updates on the U.S. response to COVID-19 that we think might be most interesting from an international perspective. Uh, last week, as many of you know, the National Institutes of Health announced positive results from its clinical trial of remdesivir, which was begun back on February 21st and eventually came to enroll more than 40 domestic and international sites in this adaptive trial, which can incorporate other promising therapeutics over time. Working towards a vaccine is also necessarily an international and multi-sectoral effort. The same evening that China shared the viral sequence of the novel coronavirus back on January 10th, scientists at our National Institutes of Health began working on a vaccine. By March 16th, in record time, they had worked with the manufacturer Moderna to begin a phase one trial. Phase two, three trial is now in planning. Collaboration with the private sector has also been essential to scale up testing to where the United States has now conducted more than 6 million tests. Our Food and Drug Administration has worked closely with diagnostics developers and granted more than 70 emergency use authorizations for different diagnostic tests, providing a range of capability. Uh, we also work closely with companies to stand up testing locations in, for example, the parking lots of retail stores like pharmacies. At first, the federal government took the lead on running testing in these locations, but we've now been able to use that as a proof of concept so that private companies take over that role going forward. We provided flexibility, in payments, and regulations for our private sector health providers, including a historic expansion of telehealth and new options for hospitals to essentially run acute care operations off-site in, say, a hotel or a dormitory. The ways in which different countries blend these private and public approaches to combat the virus can be an interesting area for international dialogue. <clears throat> in addition, of course, we work hard to make our own contribution to information sharing between nations. Here in the United States, the CDC works at the national level and supports health departments at the state and local levels to conduct case identification, surveillance, data analysis, contact tracing. These efforts produce data that CDC integrates to inform critical decisions by U.S. policymakers and authorities around the world. Now, data from the United States are available from a range of sources, not only CDC, but, also, but we also have longstanding technical collaborations with Taiwan and also our state and local health departments and higher education and research institutions. On that note, emphasizing the importance of international cooperation on these unprecedented challenges, I will conclude my remarks. And thank you all. Look forward to talking more. Thank you so much, Secretary Hargan. I had a similar experience in uh, Taiwan a few years before you. Uh, I also took classes at Guoyu Rubao and taught English in Taiwan, um, uh, 1979 to 1980. Uh, so I share those wonderful memories as well. Let me turn now uh, to my colleague, uh, Steve Morrison, uh, for his remarks as our respondent today. Steve, please go ahead. Thanks, Bonnie, uh, for uh, including me. It's a real honor to be here today with Vice Premier Chen Jimai and with Deputy Secretary Eric Hargan. Um, I, I'm suffering, as, as I listen to you, uh, uh, Vice Premier, I'm suffering from baseball envy. Um, you know, we're here, we're the home of the world champion Washington Nationals, and um, and we're we're longing for a return of baseball, and we're looking to you to lead the way here. Well, thank you uh, for bringing that point across. Um, I'm also delighted. I want to thank Taiwan for its generosity. Uh, this was mentioned, the 5 million donated masks. 
do I think six different states across the country, uh, and, and the active health diplomacy that started with the coronavirus hackathon and is over this last week, uh, these sorts of measures and, and our dialogue today are terribly I- important. You know, we're at a difficult moment here in the United States. We've had 1.2 million cases and 70, over 73,000 deaths, and we very, have very high unemployment. It's a difficult moment here, and we need hope and we need inspiration. And, uh, and I think the Taiwan model delivers of some remarkable lessons for us that are very relevant as we look ahead. We, at CSIS, we've run for the last two years a commission on strengthening America's health security. Uh, our co-chairs are former CDC Director Julie Gerberding, former Senator uh, Kelly Ayotte, and a, quite a number of six, six members of Congress and 13 other premier uh, personalities in global health, diplomacy, security, and the like. And, and the, the biggest problem that we've seen in this, in this field of health security, not just in the United States, but across the world, has been the difficulty of breaking the cycle of crisis and complacency. That, that has bedeviled us across administrations and across decades. And it's one of the things that we're pondering right now is how to break that cycle. Many of the recommendations we put forward in our big report back in November, seven of them were how to break that cycle. And I think Taiwan proves the point very dramatically that you can break that cycle. And I want to say a few words about how you've done that, which it seems to me is quite remarkable. The results you've, atri- uh, you've achieved are, are quite astonishing. <clears throat> 440 cases, six deaths. Um, there are many aspects to this very comprehensive approach that you've taken that are, that are quite unusual, I think. I mean, you moved with remarkable speed and aggressiveness. Uh, you moved very, very, very fast on the testing side, on the travel bans and close, close of ports. You took very active measures against misinformation. Uh, from the very earliest point, uh, that's something that's often been missing in the in the response. And the way you combined different data sets, combining into a big data approach, very unusual in, in being able to understand mobility and patterns uh, across across a population. You also created quarantine and isolation spaces so that people could be separated if they were infected and could go through that course, and so you minimized intra-family infections, which was which is terribly important in this. I can go on with some of these other things that you've done that are quite remarkable, but a couple of the big lessons, it's possible to have this kind of achievement and not crash your economy. Um, that's very profound. Um, it's possible to do these all things, all of these things and respect democratic norms and democratic practices. This does not rest on authoritarianism. It rests on the trust and the confidence of the people that their rights are respected and that their, this is, these actions are all undertaken in respect and in service of the, of the, of the citizens of Taiwan. You chose to take a very strategic approach. That is going back 17 years to SARS and the profound power of the SARS experience in driving your approach. Uh, back to 17 years ago, uh, when you had 150,000 people quarantined and 181 dead, that moved you to, to the top leadership, getting the legislation through, getting a, 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 a game plan together and institutionalized, doing annual hospital drills. Um, all of these steps that were establishing health security as fundamental to national security and investing over a sustained basis in building up that system. That was so fundamental. And I, the SARS experience, we didn't experience SARS, but we, nor did we understand how impactful that experience was on governments like your own in changing their outlook and, and creating this strategic approach. Another thing that's very, I think, very telling about your experience is the power of the networks that the Taiwanese have, the professional networks that reach into China. And um, those prove to be critically important in the monitoring of social media and of texting and the like in terms of your amazingly fast response rested on the quality and the extensiveness 
of those networks. It wasn't simply that you had 12 flights a day going into Wuhan. It was that you had these systems there. Um, I also think that we, we fail to understand in looking at the Taiwan experience that you understood the threat that, that you faced in terms of your proximity to China, the deep uh, uh, transport links, the, the level of visitation back and forth, almost three million people a year, that you needed to prepare in that eventuality uh, to, to, to cope with that. Um, a couple of just two other remarks on WHO. Uh, you make, Taiwan makes very valuable technical contribution to WHO, and we're grateful for that. The U.S. makes many technical contributions. Um, and it's, and WHO remains vitally important to the global response to this pandemic. We're only in the second inning of this response and, and we're seeing it march into low income and lower middle income countries with a ferocity, unlike even exceeding what we've seen in Europe and North America. There are costs and risks to Taiwan being excluded from observer status uh, in the World Health Assembly. And we understand that. And I, and I, and I support the idea that you should be part of this as an observer. You were from 2009 to 2016. We all realize the difficulties of creating a, a, a majority vote among member states in support of that proposition. Uh, it's going to require an aggressive and sustained diplomacy. It's going to require creating a, a coalition that can support you. Um, two things I'd, I hope we can hear more from you. Uh, about the future. I know you're now contemplating how to reopen travel. And that requires a very careful risk calculation uh, and a step-by-step -step approach. I'd like to know more about how you're thinking about reopening in this period and also what your strategy is for uh, getting access to new therapies. Uh, we were thrilled to hear the news of remdesivir's uh, uh, trial results and the award of the emergency use authorization. Gilead Sciences has been very generous. Uh, Dan O'Day has been super impressive. 1.5 million doses, up to 280,000 uh, courses of treatment, depending on how that's done. But uh, we, I would like to know more on your strategy for um, uh, preparing for the manufacture and distribution of vaccines when they become available but also for the therapies that will dampen the mortality and the extreme illness uh, that this uh, terrible virus is causing. But thank you again for the opportunity to be here with all of you. And, and it's been a real honor. And I look forward to the, to the next phase of our discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Steve. Uh, we're now going to turn to the Q&A portion, and uh, I'm going to pose a few questions. I want to start by asking uh, Vice Premier uh, Chen Qimai uh, about uh, the question that Steve raised about uh, Taiwan's experience in keeping businesses open and restaurants open and uh, children are attending schools. Your universities were not shut down, as I understand it. And I'd be interested in understanding a little bit more about the process that, that you were able uh, to use to keep all of your, your economy going and um, how you are going uh, to begin to allow uh, travel again. And, and, and uh, then maybe I'll ask a, uh, Secretary Hargan to tell us about how we can apply Taiwan's lessons to the process of uh, uneasing up our, our own restrictions uh, as we uh, begin to uh, come out of lockdown in so many U.S. states. So first, uh, uh, Vice Premier Chun. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, keep uh, uh, social Distancing is uh, very important to uh, prevent the uh, uh, coronavirus spread to our community. Uh, I think uh, we have managed to uh, keep a school uh, open so far. School uh, closed for winter break at uh, the time the uh, first imported case from Wuhan uh, arrived in Taiwan. Uh, we extend our school break for two more weeks until late February. 
and uh, have a thin enforced item measures such as temperature check every morning at the school gate and encouraging washing hands of our children. And uh, wearing face masks is very important also. Teachers are trained to conduct online classes as a precaution. Unless we are uh, seeing the sign of uh, community spread, we don't need to uh, go, that, go that far as to close the school and uh, uh, in introduce the lockdown. Yeah. Okay, Secretary Horgan. Yeah, I mean, it would be, we are, we are as, as Bonnie pointed out, we are, we go sort of state by state or sometimes city by city in terms of re, uh, sort of releasing the lockdown. Uh, so these are, it's very good for us to try to learn about how you prevented the spread from happening because we have found when we've left some cities open, we've seen obviously with regard to the New York metropolitan area that uh, when, when places remained open, particularly with dense populations, even if the populations were told about social distancing, basic hygiene, there were serious outbreaks. So we're, you know, we are looking forward to seeing how those things were particularly implemented uh, because we can, we can, I think all of our, our jurisdictions have now heard the word about, about washing your hands, about social distancing, about face masks. Everyone has heard these, I think, to the point that they don't want to hear them anymore from public officials, but we're still concerned that we're going to get outbreaks when these when the opening happens. Uh, I think we are we are still mostly in the case of uh, of keeping the schools closed. I haven't seen I don't think a single jurisdiction opening schools. Of course, that's classic quarantine doctrine. Those those snow days uh, that prevent the spread of uh, <laughs> of uh, of disease. Uh, but it is a, it, it's going to be an unusual challenge, especially given the the sort of the, the how this disease affects people, not affecting children, but really uh, at least affecting them, but not to the not to the level of uh, seriousness that it does the senior population. So I, I think it's going to be it would be good to know, and maybe we can talk about it offline at a staff level uh, about exactly how what exactly is the difference between the overall words of basic hygiene, face masks, social distancing, and exactly how it was implemented, because we've had a real difference within the United States between how one place and another uh, have reacted to this. So, Vice Premier Chan, um, I know that uh, not everything in Taiwan has gone uh, smoothly. There have been at least two instances uh, where there were uh, potential uh, outbreaks. And one was when that cruise ship, the Diamond Princess, uh, visited, uh, I think it was uh, um, uh, southern Taiwan, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in, uh, in Jilong. And I know you published an article uh, about that. And then the, uh, the second uh, episode uh, was Taiwan's military where apparently a uh, three-ship flotilla visited Palau. Uh, this was between March 12th and 15th. And uh, there was uh, some then potential, of course, for spread because those uh, military uh, officers and soldiers came back uh, to Taiwan. So um, can you talk about how the government responded to those challenges and the lessons that you learned from those episodes? Uh, we uh, take uh, uh, best action and uh, coordinate the different agents from our government department. Uh, for example, uh, the Diamond Cruise uh, ship, uh, this is a good example. Uh, we uh, establish a smart monitoring system for quarantines and the contact tracing that rely on phone signal. Uh, I think uh, we use the big data uh, to analyze the Diamond Princess cruise, cruise ship, uh, uh, which uh, the passenger take uh, uh, one day tour up uh, in our Taipei area. We send uh, 
uh, we send a mobile uh, broadcast, broadcast mess message to an uh, individual who uh, might uh, have been uh, contact with uh, passengers, reminding them uh, to self-monitor uh, their health and uh, take appropriate precaution. Uh, we follow up on uh, health status of this individual using the National Health Insurance Database basis. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, we conducting uh, PCR tests on those with pneumonia symptoms and notify uh, uh, medical personnel who have treated them. So this is an example we uh, use the uh, big data analysis to follow up uh, maybe the potentially uh, infected by uh, uh, by the coronavirus 19 and the use of our uh, national uh, insurance databases to follow up our uh, people. This is an example. And uh, the other question is uh, about the uh, uh, bony X is uh, the, uh, our uh, goodwill Rotilla. This is um, allowed in March for military annual goodwill and uh, uh, training mission. Uh, the Navy has uh, followed a CECC directive that uh, sailors sail, sail, sail are uh, only uh, allowed to uh, disembark 30 days after docking in another uh, nation. The Rotilla left the Palau on March 15th and uh, the crews only uh, disembark after uh, completing, completing uh, 30 days quarantine on April 15th. Uh, unfortunately, a, class, a cluster infection was found on April 18th. All crew members are quickly, uh, we uh, take the action very quickly. Uh, the members are quickly recalled for uh, testing and uh, taking the centralized quarantine facilities. And uh, the uh, investigation for the source of the infection is still ongoing. Uh, the government also used the big data analysis to identify the location where the crews had been to and share the alert with individual that had been in their uh, vicinity so that they could self-monitor their health. I think uh, this uh, uh, two example is uh, if you have a uh, uh, well established database, we can use in when whatever the pandemic or uh, epidemic uh, in country or in community. I think uh, we we just try to uh, our heart to explore a new technology to prevent the COVID nineteen or. Uh, another uh, maybe uh, invasion disease or maybe in the cancer uh, surveillance. Thank you. Hi, um, Bonnie. Yes, Steve. May, may I interject uh, one one point and question? Please. To the, to the vice premier. Um, this story of how you handled the three thousand people that came on shore from the. Uh, Diamond Princess is kind of amazing. I mean, you moved so fast and you contact traced a couple of hundred thousand people in, in order to feel confident that that this outbreak, that you did not have a, a, a an outbreak brewing within your society. Um, the um, So you had these systems in place. We're now facing a question of what what is required for us to reopen in terms of our ability to test, quarantine, isolate, contact trace, um, what kind of capacities are really needed in that regard, including how many contact tracers do we need in this country? I mean, we have estimates ranging from 100,000 to 750,000 uh, in the newest legislation in the Senate. How did you go about building this army of people uh, across, you have a network, uh, a disease, infectious disease prevention and treatment network in the nation. You formalized that, but how many years did it take you to create that and test it and put it in place so that it could be so remarkably responsive as we saw? Thank you. 
uh, I think uh, the database is uh, we uh, build a database uh, from our national uh, insurance uh, uh, database is about maybe from the, from uh, about five five years or maybe, but I think uh, uh, in the uh, condition uh, for the U.S. Maybe how to uh, keep social distancing is very important because you you open your uh, maybe market or school or or any other maybe your daily work. Uh, if you uh, keep uh, social distance, uh, you you can uh, reduce the uh, uh, the. Uh, the, uh, the the infection uh, spread to your community. So we develop a, a social distancing app. We warn you if you do not keep a, a social distancing, you will be uh, maybe a record or uh, maybe uh, 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 let uh, the maybe the cent central uh, uh, command center or CDC. To know how many uh, people uh, who contact with each other, and when the uh, when the maybe one of them uh, uh, infected by coronavirus, it may be a system work uh, to allow the other uh, uh, tell and uh, tell him tell them uh, uh, what when and the, uh, the risk they. May be infected by coronavirus, and then they can uh, to the clinic or maybe the, to the hospital to uh, uh, check a PCR test to know how uh, uh, whether or not they are infected by coronavirus. Yeah, this is my suggestion. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, Vice Premier Chen. Uh, Secretary Hargan, can you uh, talk a little bit about uh, what the risks are of excluding Taiwan? from the World Health Organization and what is the United States doing as we are in the run-up to the World Health Assembly uh, meeting on the, on the, on the 18th uh, to try and build support for the reinstatement of Taiwan's observer status at the World Health Assembly? So, so I mean, the risks uh, are, are pretty glaringly obvious. Uh, you know, the, the important part about responding to a crisis like this uh, is really information sharing, data surveillance, best practices, all those kinds of things that are necessary. Uh, that's, that's what it's, it's knowing what you're dealing with. It's knowing how other people are successfully dealing with it and knowing that you can have confidence in the information that you're getting. Those are very seriously important. Part of it obviously is dealing with the technologies, the vaccines, the therapeutics, the diagnostics that you need. But a lot of it is dealing with knowing that you have the data that you need, knowing to get it in a timely and accurate way. To exclude major jurisdiction, a major country from that, uh, particularly one in, in the East Asia, it makes no sense. Uh, it, has, it hobbles the effort uh, by its very nature. So it, uh, uh, and I think it's, it has been thrown into sharp relief, I think for everyone, uh, that, that this has been a hold and the response uh, internationally. So it's a, I, think it's a, I think it's a problem. It'll continue to be a problem going forward if things aren't turned around. Uh, and it, it doesn't make any sense. As we all know, viruses don't respect borders. They don't respect any of these kinds of arrangements. And so uh, there is a need uh, for, for a global response. You have to have everyone in the globe. Every jurisdiction uh, has to be involved and their data has to be equally uh, shared and disseminated. Uh, and I think that the early stumbles uh, in information sharing, the early inaccuracies in the data that was coming out of the center of the epidemic has led to a cascading series of problems for countries that took that data uh, and used it as a basis for policymaking. Uh, and I think so that, that just shows that there needed to be more and better information sharing early on, more and better transparency earlier on, uh, and including Taiwan uh, in that fully, uh, it would be it would have been an, a, 
useful and necessary part of this, and it will continue to be. Um, and and so I think that that's that's kind of the the level set uh, just to start off with. Uh, that's part of that's part of the background. Uh, we are, as we have been, advocating for the return of Taiwan officially to the WHO. I don't think we've ever let up on that. Uh, and uh, and so uh, you've seen some, uh, I think, positive signs uh, from other countries uh, being able to adhere to this idea. I, I think that they see the merit, as we always have, of the fact that we cannot allow uh, these kind of, uh, I don't know, political temper tantrums uh, to stand in the way of an effective global public health response. And and so, uh, you know, I, we, we are obviously supportive and we're working as we do uh, to try to advocate for Taiwan, as we always have, uh, to to have an official role in WHO. I know a lot of that takes place um, uh, kind of outside of the camera view, but it, it does take place. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so let me turn back to uh, uh, Vice Premier Chun and, and ask um, uh, if you could talk a little bit about maybe about how uh, you have won the the, uh, the confidence of your public. I think you said 95 percent are complying with quarantine measures. Uh, uh, I, we've had uh, people on, on, on the streets in some states who are demanding that we reopen. Uh, I, winning public confidence is hard in, uh, in democracies. So if you could talk a little bit about that and uh, maybe tell us one um, example of an anecdote of where you have had some demands from the public and how you've responded uh, to them. Uh, I think the, the transparency is the key. Uh, besides how difficult we have to tell the truth, we have the bad news and then work together. The CECs have held a uh, daily press uh, briefings since January during uh, this event. Uh, the uh, Minister of Health, Chen Shizhong, is very popular. He every day share the latest number of confirmed cases. Uh, they also uh, explain their approach to uh, preventing the spread of COVID-19 and uh, uh, relative policy decision. Uh, our government also share the relevant information about the coronavirus uh, from uh, many uh, social media uh, like uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and the line. Uh, there's many uh, uh, humorous pictures uh, in, in our uh, government news. Uh, all, uh, all of these measures have been helped our government to earn the trust of people, the public, uh, reduce the people's anxiety, and uh, make the public less vulnerable to, uh, to uh, the disinformation campaign. Uh, I think uh, you, you know the fake or the false uh, information uh, transmission, just like a virus infection. So you must uh, uh, take action to. Uh, uh, tackling the disinformation uh, immediately as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I think I'll just ask one last question to uh, Secretary Hargan, and that is um, uh, we have a question that's come in uh, from uh, somebody named Joseph, no, no affiliation. Uh, as we begin to reopen, our uh, cities and local uh, areas in the United States, what are the most important statistics um, and data that we should watch for? What are the, what are the indicators? Should we, we be looking at, uh, he, uh, he mentioned, stockpile of PPE, percentage of confirmed cases. Um, uh, what, do we, what do we look at to see whether we should be continuing to reopen or moving in the other direction and reimposing restrictions? Right. I think we're going to be looking at a number of things. We're going to be encouraging the local leaders to look at a number of things uh, in this in this area. One is obviously the spread of the disease, and some of it's going to be the early indications of what the background spread of the disease might have been as we have moved towards more antibody testing to see what, is there kind of a background of exposure of the, to the virus that has not been uh, understood yet. So some of it's going to be that. Uh, the background, the rise, as, as we all know, viruses spread on contact when 
when uh, we see the economies reopening, there's going to be much more possibility of people contacting each other. Uh, some is going to be obviously the uh, the uh, uh, hospitalization and fatality rates uh, to see what is what exactly is going on. That's going to be probably central to this. And then by sector, uh, exactly where are we going to see it go into, particularly with regard to vulnerable populations? Uh, I think that the surveillance is going to be more necessary on areas like nursing homes, uh, other areas, uh, senior uh, living facilities, and areas like that, uh, as well as healthcare facilities. Obviously, those are good, those are top of mind uh, for us to see whether we're going to have what some epidemiologists refer to as a as a popcorn effect with these kind of these bursts of, of transmission of the virus in very local ways. Uh, so and, and then whether or not that can be addressed at a very local level or does it require kind of a reimposition by the jurisdiction overall? Some of that is going to depend on how robust the healthcare system is uh, at the beginning. In other words, have we have we managed to get the medical the local medical system in, in a place uh, from a point of view of stockpiles for them to be able to respond effectively, both to the underlying load of regular medical procedures that they need to do with cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and so on, uh, as well as being able to uh, move to contain or mitigate the virus within the healthcare system. So some of it's just going to be marking against the robustness, the local robustness of the healthcare system, as well as the, the surveillance capacity of the local area from the point of view of testing and also kind of the uh, the ability of the local medical community to be able to identify the disease with competence. So I think that if, if that answers the question, that's those are the markers we've generally been talking about. Great. Steve, you'd like to jump in? Thank you. I know we're, we're getting late in the hour here. Just one last remark. Um, in listening to the Vice Premier speak, um, it occurred to me that your experience is so similar to New Zealand, and um, and I think there's something co- very strongly in common between the two countries, and that's really about leadership. Uh, Jacinda Ardern is not unlike your president in that she embraced this this subject and engaged her public in a very deliberate and respectful way and made the case for a quite severe lockdown over an extended period of time, won the trust and confidence of the country, and the country remained quite unified. She treated people very respectfully and openly and engaged in multiple ways with the citizenry, but had a consistent and strong and coherent message delivered over time to that public and so won won the trust and confidence of the public and the compliance was almost universal in the in the severe lockdown and what we've seen now is they're on the edge of elimination they face the same problem you face which is now how do you peel back the travel bans because you don't want to close yourself off from the world you have to renew contact by air and by sea and uh, other ways, very similar challenges, but um, it is, I just wanted to make that note that the two experiences of those, the two countries are quite similar, quite akin to one another. Thank you. I'd like to just give a minute or two uh, uh, to our, uh, our our featured speakers. We are running out of time. Vice Premier Chun, do you have any final remarks, uh, any major concerns going forward that you'd like to mention? Uh, I wish uh, to thank you, Bonnie, and uh, uh, the U.S. government uh, to, uh, uh, in many uh, uh, aspects, uh, uh, to um, help us to uh, uh, build a public health system, maybe, uh, from uh, the, the ocean, maybe, uh, it's very important uh, uh, every year we send uh, a person to uh, the CDC in the U.S. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, built a strong public health system. I think this is very important to prevent the uh, infection disease in the future. I think Taiwan model uh, can be a, maybe a successful story for 
others' democracy. We will try hard, and we we can help, and we wish we have the opportunity to join the WHO and uh, contribute to our effort to all mankind. Secretary Hargan. Yeah. Well, uh, very very stirring words uh, from you, Vice Premier. I, I want to thank everybody in this event for such an interesting conversation today, uh, both uh, Vice Premier. Chen and the team from Taiwan, as well as everyone at CSIS. I mean, we've seen that discussions like this are necessary for us to be able to share the experiences that we have. We all have different experiences, but a lot of them are dealing with the same problems, essentially, uh, with being able to contain and respond to this virus and keep in place the, uh, the the prosperity of our economies and and respecting the democratic norms that we we all embrace. I was especially interested in hearing from Vice Premier Chen about the effective work that Taiwan has done in its response, uh, particularly with regard to being able to keep the economy open through, I think, a very robust program of data surveillance, of uh, communication, and and being able to uh, work increase the speed of their response. I think through the fact that they could have confidence in a very robust data system and communication. I think that that is uh, that's a lesson. I think that we that we're going to take away from here uh, uh, in our own future within our own uh, very uh, varied uh, uh, network of jurisdictions here in the United States. But I think that there are good lessons to be learned there. So thank you for uh, thank you for that, uh, and I look forward to our sort of ongoing conversations. Thank you. And I would like to echo uh, my colleague Steve Morrison's mention of the great performance uh, led by uh, President Tsai Ing-wen uh, and your entire government in uh, doing such an exemplary job in controlling the spread of uh, the virus and winning public confidence. I hope that we and the rest of the world can continue to learn uh, from, uh, from the Taiwan model. So all of you who are listening to us uh, out there, I uh, hope you stay safe and continue social distancing. Um, and uh, thank you so much all for joining us today, Deputy Secretary, Secretary Hargan and Vice Premier Chun, and of course my colleague Steve Morrison. Um, this has been a terrific conversation, so uh, all best. Uh, and uh, uh, please keep in touch, uh, all of you out there with us at CSIS, uh, we look forward to continuing the conversation with Taiwan as well. Thank you.